So here we have the genu, the body, the splenium of the corpus callosum. And here we see the ultrasound image of this anatomy. This is the genu of the corpus callosum, the body, the splenium with the baby's head facing to our left and the posterior aspect of the baby's head to our right. This is a cingulate gyrus. And here we can see that there is bright echogenicity right below the cavum septum pellucidum and the posterior extension, the cavum virgae. This represents the choroid plexus in the roof of the third ventricle. This is third ventricle. And you might question, why does this third ventricle not look quite as anechoic as the fluid that's in the cavum septum pellucidum and the cavum virgae? The third and fourth ventricles are extremely slender. They measure no more than approximately one to two millimeters in width. And therefore, it is somewhat difficult to get an image that does not pick up specular reflectors from the brain tissue on both sides of these midline ventricles. So here we have the third ventricle with the region of the aqueduct of Sylvius going down into the area of the fourth ventricle. We have the cerebellum, this very brightly echoic structure due to the fact that it's quite vascular and there are multiple convolutional markings. Below the cerebellum is the cisterna magna and this should be looked for on every midline ultrasound view. And here we have some increased echogenicity in the region of the brain stem. Notice that the brain itself, in terms of the parenchyma, is a relatively hypoechoic structure. So here's the genu, the body, and the splenium of the corpus callosum, third and fourth ventricles. This is a baby who's somewhat more mature. You can see that there are more convolutional markings, they're a little bit serpiginous, which happens as they develop. And here we have the genu, the body, and the splenium of the corpus callosum with a remnant of the cavum septum pellucidum. This line that you see centrally represents a septal vein. Again, choroid plexus in the roof of the third ventricle, the aqueduct, the fourth ventricle, the brain stem, cerebellum, and cisterna magna. Notice that once the babies become full term, there is less visualization of the cavum septum pellucidum. Sometimes it is totally obliterated by that age. And here we see the genu, the body, the splenium of the corpus callosum, the choroid plexus in the roof of the third ventricle. Here's the fourth, the brain stem, the cerebellum, and the cisterna magna. Parasagittal views allow us to visualize the lateral ventricles, and we see here the bony structures of the cranial vault. This is the anterior, the middle, and the posterior cranial fossae. We have more convolutional markings seen on this particular image, and we can see the various parts of the lateral ventricle. This is the frontal horn, the body, the atrium of the lateral ventricle, where the body, the occipital horn, and the temporal horns meet. Housed within the atrium of the lateral ventricle is the glomus of the choroid plexus. This should be very smooth, and it should taper toward the cardothalamic groove, as well as toward the temporal horn. We should not see choroid extending into the occipital horn of the lateral ventricle. Note that there is an area anterior to the cardothalamic groove that is called the germinal matrix, and we'll talk about this in more detail in a minute. We also have the region of the caudate nucleus and the area of the thalamus. You'll notice there are little fine lines that radiate back from the posterior aspect of the body of the lateral ventricle, as well as the occipital horn. This is the periventricular blush that I alluded to when we talked about the coronal plane imaging. And these represent the vascular markings, as well as the nerve fibers that extend from the deep white matter to the periphery of the brain. The initial description was that these lines were reminiscent of the strokes of an artist's brush.
extremely important to see this detail and to be sure that it is less echoic than the glomus of the choroid plexus. If this area becomes brighter than the choroid plexus, we need to be concerned about hemorrhagic and necrotic changes, and we'll talk about that when we discuss ischemic disease of the premature brain. Going back a little bit more towards the lateral aspect, we can see the sylvian fissure, and if we would turn on Doppler, we would see the pulsations of the middle cerebral artery. And coming out a little bit farther laterally, we see the area of the insula. We also get another view that's known as the occipitomastoid view, where we use the probe right behind the ear along the region of a little opening in the skull known as the mastoid fontanelle. It's really only possible to see through this area in very young babies. And this allows us to see the lobes of the cerebellum. Notice here the right lobe, the left lobe, and we can see the area of the cisterna magna. A little bit easier to see when we put it into a view which uh, is in a more vertical presentation. Now, when routine coronal and sagittal images do not completely image abnormalities, we use whatever approach works. For instance, we may use oblique views via the anterior fontanelle to demonstrate a ventricular shunt tube. When there are posterior fossa lesions that we can't image using an anterior fontanelle approach, we'll use the posterior fontanelle. We'll also use axial views if we have difficulty following the course of a shunt tube or if we want to demonstrate an extra axial fluid collection in its entirety. It's helpful at times to see the brain stem with an axial view, the cerebral peduncles, the middle cerebral artery, the posterior cerebral arteries, and the anterior communicating artery of the circle of Willis. We can also use whatever other windows there are through the cranial vault. 